first come up. So Rob Ham is a former CIS athlete, an educator over 20 years, and a coach for 36 years. Rob is also a parent, um, and he's going to give us a perspective of the evolution of coaching over so many years and his experiences. Uh, the second panelist is Scott Hunter. So Scott Hunter is a successful entrepreneur with the Otis Group. Uh, he's a licensed CPA. Uh, he has actually he's a low handicap golfer. And uh, he's, 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 a prolific golf, he's a prolific goal scorer for the Old Timers Hockey uh, program, specifically on one goalie who's also a participant in their panelists. <laughs> our, our third speaker is, our, our third speaker I'm very, very privileged, privileged to say is Wayne Scanlon. Uh, Wayne has been covering uh, Ottawa sports uh, for the Ottawa citizens since 1987. And there's probably few more people in this room that have had that breadth of understanding and dealing with different experiences and knowing about kids in the evolution of sports over time. And the third one, or sorry, the fourth panelist is going to be Jake Ham. And Jake is going to give us the perspective as an athlete. So what we're trying to do is give you the whole scenario from a current athlete, someone who's been in it for a while, someone who's covered it, and someone who's participated in it. So, so the, this, this panel will run for about 25 minutes with, a, again, a five minute uh, section for questions. So feel free to, to ask any questions afterwards and you're more, more than welcome to, to discuss. So first I'm gonna start with, uh, with Rob. Um, and you, you can grab your mic. Uh, and my, my first question for you, Rob, is you know, should young athletes be exposed to multiple sports? Um, you know, how, should they have a diverse and fun experience? Or do you believe you know that single sport specialization is 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 actually a good solution? Well, I can only go on my own personal experience. When I was in high school, um, I played four different sports: um, football in the fall, uh, wrestling in the winter, rug rugby, and track in the spring. And that's why I was able to be one of the first. Uh, people from my high school to go to the CIS and, and play football at that level. And I firmly believe that, especially our younger kids, they need to be exposed to a diverse uh, pattern of movement skills starting when they're five and six years old. I mean, I see it, I teach grade four and five, and I, I get kids in my phys ed class who can't skip or hop or throw. Um, and some of them are fantastic athletes on the hockey rink or on the soccer field, um, but they have no conception of other movement patterns. And later on in life, um, that's not gonna serve them well. Um, I mean, I'm still moving around, I'm, I'm not young anymore, but I'm still moving around and going to the gym and, and doing all the things that I love to do based because I was exposed um, to all those movement patterns when I was younger. And as a coach, uh, one of the things when I coach now is Part of all of my practices are all about fundamental skills and movement patterns, not just about, you know, I'm gonna run the triple option wishbone. Uh, it's not about that at, at the level I coach anyway. Okay, great. Um, Wayne, and this is a good pass one to you. So in, in addition to that question, Wayne, um, obviously single sport specialization is a big deal. What do you feel from strength and conditioning coordinators when they talk talk to you about the skill sets that a kid, that a kids are bringing into to to programs nowadays, and how is how is that how is how is that impacting one their ability, and is is it is are they diverse enough in their skill set, or are they so hyper focused that they're limiting and, and have to work on them a lot much more? Yeah, you really uh, you really teed up that question for me because <laughs> I was I was fortunate enough to. Uh, have the, the time and the space to uh, do a four-part series for the Ottawa Citizen, in fact, for the entire post media chain. And I was stunned by the, the nerve that it struck across the country, really. And the most popular piece of the four-part series was an interview I did with Chris Schwartz, who, of course, is the strength uh, coach for the, uh, the Ottawa Senators. And he had a bee in his bonnet about this topic for some time, and so I was glad to, to sit down with him and, and let him express himself. But his concern was that even with elite athletes coming through to his level, so I mean these are these are hockey players that have played junior hockey, that maybe they've been to college, he was astounded, and this picks up on what, what Rob was talking about, he was astounded at their lack of uh, just fundamental basic athletic ability. He said, you know, you, you throw a football or toss a puck over their shoulder and, and they can't react. They just 
they kind of skate in straight lines and, and they're, they're strong, they're fed, they, they, they have some hockey skill. But the problem is with, with kids, kids either aren't playing at all because their, their parents are afraid to send them outside because the, you know, the boogeyman's going to kidnap them. Or they, they funnel them into to soccer or to hockey or whatever the case may be at age 9 or 10 and they just haven't had that chance to express themselves physically. So uh, Chris said to me, go home and you know, if you're a parent, go home and have your kids you know, try one of these things. Somersault, catch with either hand, catch a ball with either hand, and run back or try to run backwards. And he said, you'd be astounded at how many kids cannot do these three things. And because you can't do these three things, there's some fundamental movement skills that you're missing out on. So you know, that was kind of the starting point for, for this series that, that we went through. And he talked about you know, the early movement skills, and then when you get into your teenage years, you can add some strength component. And then you know, there's lots of time to specialize, get into you know, be the hockey player you want to be, or the golfer, or the volleyball player, and go from there. So he accused people these days of trying to Frankenstein things. Like they're coming to him with their 12-year-old and saying, make, can you make my kids skate faster? You know, and you know, his simple answer is it's, it's not that simple. You know, just let them go out and play, be an athlete, try a lot of different things. There's lots of time to specialize. And he said, sport is not a dance rehearsal. You know, you've got to be able to adapt and react. And a player like Kyle Turris of the Ottawa Center is a great example. He was he thought he was going to be a lacrosse player. I mean, that was his, you know, probably his main sport. And he played hockey and baseball as well. All those athletic skills, you watch him protect the puck, you watch him, you know, fight off a check, and you'll see those early lacrosse skills paying off in this National Hockey League player. So Anyway, those are just a few opening remarks. Okay, that's great. Uh, does anyone else have any specifics on, on sports specialization? Uh, Scott, I have a, a question for you as a successful entrepreneur. Uh, one, one of the things that I, I attest to with sports is it builds uh, drive, grit, determination, uh, and uh, in, a, in certain cases, ability to handle criticism. Uh, this has changed over time. You know, now youth have less ability to handle criticism, and as soon as they're they're put up with a a, a, a block or a roadblock, they quit. So, you know, in your mindset, you know, going back to your experience as, as an athlete, you know, a lot of these things carry over into your professional life. What would you recommend, um, you know, to to the youth of this generation, so that they realize that you know, for you to be successful, you can't quit on things. You have to pursue, persevere. You have to continue. But what would you recommend based on, you know, as an athlete to a professional, how does that translate? How do you get, keep people committed to, to finishing something? Well, um, uh, well certainly we, we do shelter, shelter the kids today with regard to challenging them and, and giving them a little bit of a hard time if things don't work out perfectly. Um, I, I've spent some time coaching house league, etc., and was surprised to see uh, the young dudes that, that withdrawn from the point of, of taking some shots. Messed up on a golf shot. For me, um, <coughs> excuse me. For me personally, for for my kids and, and for the family and for their friends, we got we, we got them involved in just in the way you're talking about, Wayne, in the sense of not just not just golf, not just hockey, um, soccer, rugby. My daughter played for uh, played for Queens. Uh, sorry, Guelph. She'll kill, she'll kill me for that. Uh, played for Guelph and, and got to the nationals. So that, that ability, you know, that, that opportunity for them to be multi-sport oriented um, has been a big help. Um, when, I look at, uh, when I look at what we do, and I, I'll talk a little bit about just being an old guy that plays rec hockey and, and some quasi-poor golf, okay, <laughs> Brendan. <laughs> um, the, the, the taking the criticism from your friends or the, or the jiving as that, as that goes, uh, one story is, is just walking into walking into the club and saying to my wife, um, you know, I'm going to be nice tonight. I'm not going to say anything nasty about my friends and uh, Tom. And uh, <laughs> I got about 15 feet away from from a very close friend, uh, Gary Beach, and he gave me a shot about my belt not matching my shoes. And uh, he's a clothier, so <laughs> I turned to my wife and said, you know, that's how long it takes, okay, before you get it. So, so talking about the kids and, and having the kids taking a little bit of ribbing and things like that, yeah, that would help them out a little bit. 
Okay, and same question for you, Rob. You know, uh, in terms of drive, grit, uh, determination, handling constructive criticism as a coach, uh, and, and doing it for so many years, has you have you seen that deprecated? Are, are, are people less willing to um, handle criticism and, and take feedback? Is is there a drastic change in how people are, are willing to to actually listen to the educators and the coaches? Well, like you pointed out earlier, I've been coaching since 1982. And uh, when I first started coaching, as Mr. McKenna in the back will attest, I was a much different person in 1982 and 83 than I am now. So it's not just the kids that have changed, coaching has changed. And how we uh, approach kids. Kids today are, live, they live in the moment. And if the moment is not right then, then that's when they turn it off. You cannot coach today's athletes, especially at the high school level, the same way that I would have coached them in 1985. They will not play for you. They won't, they won't participate. Um, you have to be positive all of the time because they can't handle being shown up in front of their peers. The other thing they, they really struggle with is any kind of negativity because they think they're in trouble. They think they've done something wrong. So you really have to couch how you coach. And I come up with my own term in one of the books that I've published called Feed Forward instead of Feedback. So when you're talking to an athlete and you're trying to get them to um, improve their performance, what you're doing is giving them advice on what they can do better next time so in the future, in the forward, they may do it. But you really have to watch what you say, how you say it, and when that feedback, when that feed forward happens. Because if it's at the wrong moment, if, it, if you don't have your wits about you about what you want to say, then you might lose that athlete because they don't have the resiliency skills that maybe I had you know, back in the 70s when I was playing or when Tom McKenna had when you know, Coach Irwin and I would be yelling at him about you know, why'd you throw that interception, what, you know, just something like that. Um, I've even noticed it coaching my own kid. Uh, I coached my own son for quite a while, and you know we really had to be very, very careful of how we interacted as father son rather than coach player. And there's a lot of things to avoid there, which is a topic of another discussion. But the resiliency skills that are developed during athletics and sport are the, one of the best things that can happen in any athlete at any level. It doesn't matter whether that's a rec league football league or whether it's um, uh, AAA hockey. The ability to be coached is something that all coaches value. Are you coachable? If you're not, you're not going to get to the next level. Are you willing to listen to what a coach is trying to teach you? And, and one, one of the things to add to what Rob said, and you're, you're seeing this a lot more in the media, specifically with the NCAA, is body language. Coaches are actually saying, you know, I'm going to bench you if you're going to be on the sidelines hunched over, upset, frustrated, because that's symbolic to what, what you're representing. That's the culture you're creating for the organization, for the team. Um, do you have that experience where people immediately react physically when they're upset? Do they cross their hands? Do they? And how would you rectify this question? Is for everyone. How do you? How do you? Because again, the, the the challenge here is, you know, I look at teaching. Everyone who is a teacher has to have credentials. They have to, you know, be accredited to deliver a curriculum. You have a lot of volunteer coaches that are, have no time. Um, they're usually doing this at, at the kindness of their hearts. Um, but they're unfortunately unqualified, untrained, and there's a lot of things that you're saying that they may not know. So how do we, you know, fix this? How do we educate and create awareness so that you know these key, these key issues, uh, specifically when it comes down to understanding discipline and how do you react to things, is taught effectively and not assumed? Well, do you want to start, Wayne? No, no, take it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, there are. Um, Every sport in Canada has a certification program. Whether it's hockey, or football, or table tennis, or wrestling, or you name it. They all have a certification program. And 
I think if you really want to be a coach, whether you're volunteering, whether you're getting paid, it, it behooves you to go and get some of the certification. So in my experience in football, I mean, Football Canada has a wide range of coaching certification available, everything from, you know, learning how to coach little kids all the way up to um, CIS athletes. So that's one avenue. The other avenue is, it's really important that coaches uh, take courses on ethical decision making and how to um, make the right choices when they're coaching. And that's key. So it's the ethical decision making and getting the certification. Okay. And uh, this, this one is for, for, uh, for your son. So uh, obviously your father coached you a little bit. Um, how do you feel about coaches coaching their own kids? And what was your experience? Um, <laughs> is it good, bad? And, 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 and I'll, give you a per I'll give you a personal example. I quit baseball because I had the traditional stereotypical, the father was coaching the, the pitcher, I didn't start, he started his son, and I'm like, you know what, that's not, I don't want that. So give me a sense of, a, of your scenario and how, how it went out. Throughout high school, it was very good, usually because we had at least three coaches in between us <laughs> to make sure that you know everything was fair. So I ended up starting both all three years, so it, it was fine. I nothing ever came between us. Car coaching was none, which is a big thing because I, I know a lot of kids, even guys I play with now, who would get in the car and they just hear it from their parents about how this you could have done this better. Do you even like playing the sport? All this stuff. And it brings their, almost their mood down. And if parents, I think, don't realize that they're doing that, sometimes they're just so heated, they're so passionate about it. But you have to kind of take a step back and realize that you're causing damage to the kids. So, and, so uh, I was lucky not to have to go through that. What, what's, then what's the parent's role in their child's athlete's development? What, what, what's, what would you consider the parent's role? I coach now, so I coach the seven, eight, nine-year-olds, and I tell them, you guys can be supportive, but you can't bench coach. And I don't want, it's not that I don't want you to be there and support your kids, because I know you love them, but coaches coach, players play, and parents be parents. You support and love. Not negative talking, no yelling from the sidelines ever. If you do that, you're usually asked to leave. That's just, just the way it should be. If you want to yell at your kid from the sideline, just leave the stadium. It's just the way it should be. As from a parent and coming from a, as a coaching standpoint, the kid then automatically loses focus. He, they don't want to play anymore because oh my dad yelled at me. I'm in trouble. I'm gonna get it when I'm in the car. So they just completely lose focus during their games, during practice, all that stuff. So and is that the responsibility of the team to rebuild his confidence? Is the responsibility of the coach? Is the responsibility of the parent? Or? It's. I think it's it's the responsibility of the team and the coach when you have a parent that is yelling at their kids, you need to take that kid aside and say, look, they're your parents, they love you, but right now you're a player, you're an athlete. You need to listen to your coaches. The coaches know what's right. They know how well you're playing. They know what you can do better. So so obviously now being an athlete, and your, your experience is you, you played high school sports, you played multiple sports. Yeah, I did it at, at Ashbury here in Ottawa. I went there for three years. I did football, hockey, and track, and then I went to boarding school uh, just outside of DC called Episcopal and there you were mandatory to play three sports. So we had football, indoor track, outdoor track. So I mean, I love track and field. If I didn't go to college to play football, I would have gone to college to throw shot put. So it was my second love during the school year. So, so why do you think that they're so adamant that you have to participate in three sports? It's just building, they want to build the best person possible and I think athletics in that setting, you had 480 kids living in a boarding school all together all the time. And athletics were a way of competing with one another, but also building up a school community through sports. Okay. Um, thank you very much. So uh, the next question I want to pose to everyone is, obviously coaching has evolved over the last 10 to 20 years. What are some of the good things versus some of the bad things that you're seeing with the evolution of coaching? And is that largely due to part of these academies that are hyper-focusing on specialization for their sports? 
or is it just that the behavior of athletes overall has been changing so that they, everyone kind of has to change with it? You know, attention spans are obviously less. So what, what do you see as, over the last 10 to 20 years, the evolution of coaching and, and good and bad? Do you have any examples or uh, talking points that you'd like to reference for that? Uh, for me, I just started coaching since I'm still playing university. And I know talking to alumni at our events in Toronto and stuff, they say even our head coach has changed the way he coaches. You know, 10, 20 years ago, he was a totally different man than he is today. He's much more calm and collective. He tries his hardest not to yell in practice, but when you're dealing with grown men, it's a little bit different than when you're dealing with kids, I think. But his, his mentality has completely changed. You know, we used to be in full pads every practice, hitting each other, going really hard, and now we've completely changed that. We rarely hit each other. Is yeah. he afraid to be a coach the old way now, simply because of what's out there? I don't think so. I think he's just realized to get better success out of all of his athletes, I think that he's realized he had to change. I don't think he's necessarily scared because there are some days where he shows the old time coach, occasionally. Uh, does anyone want to elaborate on that uh, evolution of coaching in the last 10 to 20 years? Yeah, well, I think the uh, the hand boys here made some very, very strong points, and uh, I think coaching has changed. I think there's more pressure on coaches now than ever before. I mean, there's a few of us old in this room that are old enough to remember when parents dropped the kids off at the rink or the sporting field, and then they maybe came back later, or maybe they caught a ride with somebody else. I mean, they just weren't as engaged. I mean, the line that I can remember most when our kids were playing hockey was, you know, some parent yelling out, change them up, you know, like they basically coaching from the stands, wanting the lines changed so that, you know, his, his son would get out there sooner. But I think the pressures on, on coaches is difficult. And, and as Rob has said, you have to change the way you coach. I think I'm seeing that even in the NHL. Guy Boucher is not the same coach now that he was four or five years ago. He can't be. I mean, the, the young players coming up, Again, as Rob touched on, um, they can't take the criticism, and they don't, they don't take shouting. It, it, it ha there has to be a more personal approach, and I think the really good people managers, the good coaches, they can chuckle things, and they can manage people, and they know which player needs a bit of a nudge, and, and which one needs a little bit more of a coddle. Um, it's a, it really is kind of a work of art. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, Scott? <coughs> From, uh, from coaching house league and, and the experiences there, and, and both with kids that were, were my hockey players uh, as well as my son, um, significant challenges, particularly when you're coaching your son in, amongst these 12 or 15 guys and uh, young men. And the challenges that came back, not so much for me, but for my son, Michael, in the sense of um, other teammates look at him and say, you're the coach's son, you're getting privilege. So there, so there's a responsibility as, as the coach and the parent at the same time. Um, not to go too far off to, to, to isolate, isolate your child, but at least be fair in the context of the rest of the players on the team. Um, the other thing that we, we did, and this, this relates more to golf, um, he became quite a very good golfer. And there was a point where you back off. I simply didn't have the skill sets to teach him any more of the game. Aside from the fact that he's 15 and looking at me and saying, Dad, you don't have the skill set. <laughs> it was important at that time as he reached levels of being a scratch golfer um, that you had to get an appropriate professional place to, to coach him and help him, uh, help him improve his game. So those are my experiences. Um, the other one is, is about, the, about the boys again. And, and there was one young man that played for me, uh, I think he was around 14 years old, and he was missing every second game. And, uh, you know, you're, you're asking me earlier about giving him a little bit of a hard time and that. And I did. I gave him a hard time. I said, like, you know, um, we need you. Where were you? And I put it a little more gently than that. Well, the problem was that his, his parents were separated. And his mother would bring him one week. And his father wouldn't bring him the next week. So as a, so as a father and a coach, you're going, wow, well, okay, that, that was a lesson that was extremely important. So listening to the kids, um, providing the appropriate leadership, I guess listening is the big point there. Okay. And so, Rob, I'm going to have you answer the question about how coaching has evolved, but I also want you to answer the question about how do you feel about coaching uh, your own kids? Like, how do you feel about the experience of, uh, and, and what, what, what do you see you've done well, and what have you seen that you've done poorly? 
I think it was uh, the hardest thing as a father, uh, besides watching him being born, that I ever did. Honestly, that's an honest answer. The hardest thing I ever did was coach my own kid because I knew the dangers. Like I knew that our relationship could be strained if I didn't do it right. And I think as fathers and mothers, I think that we, we really have to be careful of how we approach that. And I see Kevin Pigeon over there, he coached both of his own sons. And I know his experience was just as positive as mine has been. Um, because Kevin, like me, was able to divorce himself between coach and parent. And I, it's critical. Um, the person, the people in your child's life that are most important are the parents. And if you wreck that relationship by being a coach and a bad parent at the same time, you might never get that relationship back. So you have to be very careful if you're coaching your own kids. It, listen, there was some days, especially when he was 11 and 12 and those, those, that age group, where he was not playing well and not doing what we wanted, but once we crossed that white line, we didn't get in the car and he didn't hear all about it all the way home. So that is, that's key. In terms of coaching evolution, I find myself coaching right now um, high school age players and then in the fall I coach NCAA players at St. Lawrence University in, in Canton, New York and the biggest thing I found I'm going to go back to it is now I'm less of a system and fundamentals coach I'm way more of you need a hug or you need to talk to me or you need you need the mental part of the game and it's all about that growth mindset piece is you know, a lot of them will say to me, I, I, I just, I don't feel like training today. I don't, I don't, I can't do that. And my words now are, yeah, you can't do it. And then I add, yet. And you will do it if you just stick to it. I, that's huge right now. It's that whole mindset around, I'm still not getting it. Well, you have to keep trying. And you'll get it. You wouldn't be at that level if you wouldn't, if the coaches wouldn't have you at that level if they didn't know you could get it. So, Ron, so, is it fair to say then that, you know, a core competency that is basically one of the evolutions of coaching is emotional intelligence? Coaches need to be... Absolutely. Okay. Abs absolutely. It's number one. I, I see Brendan Bell in the audience. Like, so, you have a lot of perspective because you've played in hockey and all over the place. So, what are your perspectives on just some of the things we're talking about? But that whole mental piece. Pretty accurate. It's very clear to me that you made the same no matter whether you're yeah. on or sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that I, I've seen it. I played for 19 teams in 13 years of pro, uh, so I had a lot of different coaches, obviously, uh, and a lot of different styles. And uh, my junior career, I spent under Brian Kilray, and uh, you know, everybody in this room knows Brian and probably knows the way that he coached, uh, and that wouldn't fly today. It, it couldn't. Um, and not to say that I, you know, was raised tough and all that stuff. I wasn't. Uh, I was the kid that needed a push and needed a kick, and I got more than a few of them from him. Um, but I also know that uh, that my son, you know, is very young. It is just about to be seven years old, and you couldn't coach him that way. There's no, there's no chance, and I wouldn't put up with it. Um, so, it, times change, people change. Um, the way that we coach and the way that we, you know, this stuff is important. I'm just. To keep reading the uh, the front page of the uh, presentation on uh, the athlete mindset, the athlete mindset has changed incredibly over you know 13 years of my, my professional career. Um, the way that the way the coach is approaching, and Scanner said it earlier about Guy Boucher, um, he's a different coach today than he was four or five years ago with Tampa. You have to be, you have to adapt, you have to listen, you have to take this stuff in. It may sound like you know the the Brian Kilray in me says we're being soft. <laughs> realist says it's the right way to do things. Thank you. Uh, so that concludes the, the first panel. Okay, so have a round of applause for you.